All right, so I guess we can get started. Um, my name is Johan Hedberg. I uh, work at the Open Source Technology Center at Intel and um, been working with uh, Zephyr now for about two years, specifically on the Bluetooth support there. And um, in this talk, I'll be going through basically what we have right now in, in, in Zephyr, uh, what kind of hardware you can run uh, the Bluetooth functionality on, um, what features it has, and basic steps for uh, creating devices and applications using Zephyr and uh, Bluetooth. So uh, before we go into the uh, specifics of, of, of Zephyr, just a quick summary of what I'm mostly talking about when I talk about uh, Bluetooth support. I talk about uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, um, which is uh, a rather new addition to the Bluetooth specification. Um, it was introduced in um, 2010 for the uh, Bluetooth 4.0 specification. And uh, it's gone through various names in its history. Uh, there was the Bluetooth Smart marketing name that the Bluetooth SIG was using for quite a long time, but they have dropped it now, so it's just called Bluetooth Low Energy. And uh, in very many places, you hear, hear it referred to simply as uh, BLE. Um, it's the same uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency as classic Bluetooth, but it's a little bit different when it comes to the uh, radio modulation. Uh, you get, um, well, you got until Bluetooth 4.2 about the same range um, and um, one megabit per second uh, bandwidth. Uh, Bluetooth 5, which came out just at the end of last year, uh, improves on both of these aspects. You get uh, up to two megabits per second and uh, about four times the range. Uh, with the range, of course, uh, you have to compromise with the uh, uh, throughput of the data that you get. Um, unlike Bluetooth Classic, uh, you get drastically smaller power consumption with uh, low energy. You, you can run for years with a small coin cell battery. And um, devices supporting uh, Bluetooth low energy are generally categorized in, in two different um, types of um, devices. Uh, one is pure Bluetooth uh, low energy devices, or so-called single mode devices, that only have the low energy radio. Um, this would typically be sensors, uh, like a heart rate belt or something like that. And uh, then the other type is the one which also supports uh, the uh, Bluetooth Classic. And uh, these are so-called dual mode devices. And that's what you would find on a PC, for example, or on your uh, mobile phone. And Bluetooth Low Energy is perfect for uh, uh, Internet of Things kind of use cases, as I'll try to uh, outline throughout this presentation. So uh, the Zephyr um, Bluetooth stack, uh, it's part of the core Zephyr, open source as such. Um, we are 4.2 compliant. Uh, we've been working on 5.0 features uh, ever since the specification went out, but uh, that's something that's going to continue basically throughout this year um, as we add more and more of those features. Uh, we are feature complete when it comes to the mandatory set of features, but there's lots of optional things in the Bluetooth specification. and. Uh, we are working on uh, adding those as, as we get uh, uh, good use cases for them. We have many um, optional features that uh, you will not find in many typical um, Bluetooth stacks. Um, uh, one such thing is the um, L2CUP connection or the channels for LE, which is a prerequisite for uh, doing IPv6 over uh, LE. Um, the uh, six slot pan uh, protocol and uh, IPSP is the, the high level profile for that. Uh, we have uh, LE Secure Connections, which is a security enhancement from Bluetooth 4.2, uh, which improves on the security of the uh, pairing. Uh, we have data length extensions, which is a 4.2 feature as well uh, for the controller. Um, even though I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, we also have uh, Bluetooth Classic support in Zephyr. So it's possible to build devices that uh, utilize both Low Energy and Bluetooth Classic, or only Bluetooth Classic. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And um, the stack uh, consists of a, a controller part and the, uh, the host part. And you can build either or. I'll, I'll go into the details later. But the main thing is that we are using a uh, standard HCI uh, protocol between the host and the controller, whether they're running on the same uh, CPU or whether we have them split with a Bluetooth controller on one and, and host on another, another CPU. Um, and since uh, Zephyr 1.6, uh, we have 
uh, support for the Bluetooth controller role as well. This is a fairly new thing when it comes to open source. There haven't been uh, pretty much any uh, open source Bluetooth controller implementations before last year. But uh, I'll give some more details on that also later in the presentation. So the general architecture uh, that we have, um, we have a fairly high level uh, set of uh, APIs that we uh, expose to APIs, uh, to, to applications, sorry. And uh, uh, the main uh, two profiles that the application would be talking to is the generic um, access profile and the generic attribute profile. Um, the uh, generic access profile is kind of everything which doesn't fall into a very um, specific use case. So this would include uh, discovering devices or being discoverable yourself. Um, the profile uh, um, generally groups um, roles into two different pairs. You have uh, so-called uh, uh, connection-oriented uh, use cases where you, uh, you're creating connections between two devices. Uh, there you have one device which is uh, called the peripheral, that would typically be your sensor type of device, and the one that connects to the peripheral is called the central, uh, your phone, for example. Uh, you can also do uh, connectionless um, use cases where um, you have a device that's looking for other de devices, so-called beacons. Um, this device that's looking for them is called the observer, and then the um, opposing role is uh, called the broadcaster. And uh, you can configure Zephyr to support any kind of combination of these roles. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we have uh, IPv6 uh, over LE support, which is a fairly uh, uh, unique thing, I would say, when it comes to Bluetooth stacks. Not many Bluetooth stacks support that. I'm not really sure why it hasn't gotten that much traction yet in the industry. Um, but that's something that you can do with, uh, with uh, Zephyr. Uh, the main uh, reference we've been using for testing this is Linux, because that's one of the few other stacks we know of, uh, the BlueZ stack that supports uh, IPv6 over uh, LE. Uh, then below all of these profiles, uh, we have an abstraction we call the HI driver, which basically hides away the details of how we talk to the Bluetooth controller, whether it's running on the same CPU or if it's connected through some kind of physical transport like uh, UART or uh, SPI or USB. Um, and if it's on the same CPU, then it's just basically buffers uh, like passed in runtime memory from uh, the host to the controller or vice versa. But it's always a standard HCI. And um, we've been able to test this on lots of different hardwares. Um, we're able to run this on just normal PC hardware in, in QM1, use any Bluetooth adapter there. I'll have a bit more about that later, as well as then actual microcontroller boards. Um, we have quite many uh, in our uh, device library. And uh, you can configure pretty much any aspect of this uh, stack through kconfig. Disable the features that you don't want. Um, adjust the buffer sizes to match your use cases, the buffer counts, uh, how many connections you need, how many per devices you need, and uh, so on. All of these are configurable. A um, little bit about the stack, how it's set up at runtime. Um, so specifically the, the host side of the stack. So at the bottom, we have um, the HUI driver, which hides away the details of, of talking to the controller. Um, we have two threads, uh, which handle the two directions of data coming um, from the controller and going to the controller. Um, this is something, by the way, that has recently improved in, in Zephyr um, for the uh, 1.7 release. In uh, Zephyr 1.6 and earlier, uh, there wasn't any API to wait on multiple kernel objects uh, in a single call. So we were forced to have multiple uh, transmission threads for every single connection, because every connection has its own uh, transmission queue. So we need to have a separate thread to wait on that queue and process data from it. Uh, Zephyr 1.7 is introducing a new KPOL API, which allows us to wait on multiple kernel objects in one go. So we've been able to merge together the connection uh, TX threads into a single one, and also include the um, HCI command sending thread into this one. So there's one TX thread, and then there's one RX thread for um, data coming from the controller. Um, just a quick. Uh, a summary of the types of data that's going to and from the controller. Um, from the controller, we are either getting HCI events, 
which is basically kind of uh, signaling or metadata related stuff. And then um, you have data going con over connections uh, if you're connected to other devices, which is called ACL data. And you have the same in the other direction, except instead of HI events, you have HI commands that we send to the controller. Um, if the HI driver uh, inherently has some kind of thread of its own. We also have the ability to uh, say that don't bother creating a separate uh, thread on the uh, host side. Just uh, use the same uh, thread for the receive path that the controller already has. Uh, this saves a considerable amount of mem memory whenever we are able to do that. Uh, typically, the thread stacks that we have are about one kilobyte, maybe more. So uh, th that's roughly what you save. If you have an HI driver that's able to do this. Um, our UART HI driver utilizes this. The um, native controller HI driver does it as well. So the host doesn't have its own, own uh, thread for receiving data. Um, a key part of uh, the Bluetooth stack and the way we process data are network buffers. Uh, that's something we share uh, with the uh, networking stack and the IP stack in Zephyr as well. And uh, this saves a lot of uh, basically code size when we've been writing uh, parsers for and encoders for uh, protocol data because uh, the network um, buffer API comes with its own helpers for uh, encoding and decoding different types uh, to the buffers. Um, they also uh, make it possible to easily handle fragmentation, so you can have a, a linked list of uh, buffers and pass those around. So you don't need to um, have extra, extra handling for that or have one like, huge buffer where you put individual fragments, but you just change them, uh, chain them after each other. And uh, these buffers can be passed around between different threads through different kernel objects. You don't need to copy data around and so on, so we achieve almost zero copy operation like this. Um, and uh, they go not just from uh, like the bottom of the uh, stack from the controller up to, up to the host, but they also go between subsystems. So uh, if you are doing IPv6 over LE, um, the uh, data goes in the same network buffer from the Bluetooth subsystem over to the IP stack, or vice versa, without, uh, without having to uh, do any copies of the data when it goes. Um, then a little bit about the basic steps when you want to create uh, your um, application that uses Bluetooth functionality, what, what you need to do. Um, the first thing that you would typically start off with is uh, looking at your use cases and deciding what exactly are the features uh, that you need. Uh, the HA driver would in practice come from what hardware you have selected. Uh, do, do you have split uh, Bluetooth controller and Bluetooth host running on different CPUs? Do you have them on the same? CPU or not, uh, what, what, what is the transport? If, if you have one of the uh, transports that um, Zephyr supports currently, uh, such as UART or SPY, then you can just select one of the existing um, ones that we have in Zephyr. If you have something more exotic than that, then uh, you'll need to implement your own HI driver. Um, then you can select the exact features that you want. Um, do you want to do connection-based operation? Do you just want to be a beacon? Um, how strong security do you need? Um, and do you want to do uh, signed data when you send it and, and so on? And uh, also, how big is the data that you want to send? Uh, how many uh, buffers you need and so on? All these are uh, k-config options in the Zephyr Bluetooth stack. And um, many of these, uh, like uh, for the maximum number of connections, you can go and set it to zero. And this will disable all of the connection-oriented functionality in Zephyr. It will save a lot of. Uh, code size and, and runtime memory as well. And uh, for pretty much every single module in the Bluetooth stack, uh, we have debug options. Uh, and specifically, you're able to enable and disable debug logs on a per module basis. So when you go ahead and try to find where an issue is with the stack, you can enable the logs exactly for the module that you're uh, interested in. Um, the Linux kernel has uh, something called dynamic debug, uh, where you can basically at runtime go ahead and enable and disable. Uh, because of the uh, memory constraints of the devices that Zephyr usually runs on. Um, the, uh, we don't have that at runtime, but it's instead pretty much the same thing that you get, except you need to do it uh, at build time through uh, kconfig. Um, once you've selected the options, you want to start writing your application. Uh, we have one main initialization API that you uh, uh, start up 
uh, the Bluetooth stack with, this will go ahead and contact the Bluetooth driver and make sure that the transport there works, that the um, uh, Bluetooth uh, hardware or the radio is responsive to uh, read basic information about what it can do. Um, if you're doing um, a generic attribute profile based um, uh, application where you do connections and expose data to devices, you would register your services. And once you've registered your services, um, you want to uh, start advertising them to other devices so they can connect to you and, and discover them. And uh, typically, your service would be connected to some physical sensor of sorts. Uh, so once you're connected, uh, there's a simple PT got notify API to send out updates on the uh, value of that sensor. And uh, for essentially all of the APIs that we have, um, for the Bluetooth stack in Zephyr, uh, we have sample applications in the source tree that you can go uh, ahead and look at, which will show exactly how the APIs are used. Uh, those are found under uh, samples Bluetooth. We have some um, test applications as well. Uh, they are not necessarily as uh, good references for somebody starting basically from scratch looking at how to write an application, but uh, there's a test uh, subdirector also in Zephyr, which uh, you'll be able to find even more code. And pretty much all of those uh, applications that we had will run on most of the uh, boards that Zephyr currently supports. Uh, whether it's a board with a single um, CPU with the controller there or with the split uh, architecture. Um, then a little bit about um, what kind of development support we have for uh, doing uh, Bluetooth development. When we got started with Zephyr and uh, implementing a Bluetooth stack for it, uh, we didn't actually use any real hardware as, as such um, to get quickly started with the development. We were using QEMU, and uh, we were able to take advantage of the support that Linux has to hook that up with uh, Zephyr and um, basically have Linux expose its Bluetooth hardware to QEMU looking like a normal uh, UART-based uh, Bluetooth controller, and then use that for uh, development. The big advantage with uh, having the data going through uh, Linux is that we can use the tracing tools available there. So there are nice uh, decoders for all traffic going through uh, HCI, and we didn't need to implement any of our own for Zephyr. So instead, we just run uh, the existing tools that are available in, in Linux. And uh, GDP, uh, GDB support is, of course, something that you get with Q, QM also. Um, before I go further, I just wanted to do a quick demo here. Hopefully, it works for how simple it is to, um, to use your uh, laptop, for example, to run a, um, a quick um, Zephyr Bluetooth application. So uh, there are basically just two steps involved. Uh, first, you ask uh, BlueZ to export your uh, Bluetooth adapter to, um, uh, uh, sorry, I can see it perfectly here. <laughs> Let's see. Is that any better? No? Green on light, some of it. What, what did you say? Uh, it's green on black. Does that work? Yeah. All right. So there's a tool called uh, BT Proxy, uh, which basically it opens a socket to the kernel, um, creates an exclusive um, channel to your Bluetooth adapter, and then you can choose how to export it further. So um, by passing minus U, it will create a unique socket, which then the, uh, when you ask Zephyr to be running QEMU, it will connect to the unique socket and it will look like a, a UART device to Zephyr. So, so you start the um, BT proxy. Um, I'll start another terminal here so you can see. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. So I'll start the HCI um, tracing. Uh, application called BTMon, which will show, uh, show all the uh, HCI data that's going. And then in another terminal, I'll run Zephyr itself. So, so I'll use the, um, so if we go to um, 
samples Bluetooth. You can see that there are lots of very simple applications there. I'll use the um, peripheral uh, sample, which is a simple kind of sensor type application. And all you do is run make QML. And in the other terminal, you should see Zephyr starting to talk to the Bluetooth controller once this builds. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, here you see that Zephyr has initialized. It has started advertising. Here you can see the data that it's uh, discussing with the Bluetooth adapter on my laptop. So that's basically all that's needed to start using it. Now, just for demonstration purposes, that is actually using physical hardware. I'll use an app on my phone to uh, look for the device. Of course, there are too many here. And then I'll connect it. So I'm now connecting from my phone. You can see the data going through. You can see the, all the decoding of the data, what's happening there, the attribute protocol, and so on. And I'll disconnect like that. So that's pretty much all it takes to uh, get started with uh, Zephyr Bluetooth development, even though you don't have any actual hardware except your uh, own PC to run, to run on. But uh, then let's go to actual physical hardware. Uh, we wanted to be able to still keep using um, Bluesy uh, decoders like the BT1 that I showed you there. And uh, there's a special option that you can enable in, in the Zephyr Bluetooth stack, which uh, converts your console UART into a binary protocol, uh, which we call the Bluetooth uh, monitor protocol. And uh, what it effectively does is that um, it interleaves the HI traffic that's going on between the, the host and the controller in, in Zephyr with the normal system logs. So you, you can have uh, uh, print K or print F calls, uh, which then get encapsulated into in packets which go through this binary protocol. And uh, instead of running, I, I run BT1 without any parameters here so that it just monitors everything that's happening. Uh, what you need to do is you just give minus minus TTY and you give you the uh, serial device that you have your physical board connected to. And you'll be able to trace everything that's happening there, the system logs and, and the uh, HEI traffic that's happening. <coughs> and uh, at least for the boards that I have, this has been super helpful in, in uh, debugging, is just seeing exactly what's, what's going on there, where you typically uh, don't get enough information simply from the normal logs. Uh, that are uh, uh, put there. Oftentimes, if, if you don't have this kind of functionality, you have to put lots and lots of different uh, printfs around the place to find out what's happening and so on. But with this, you see exactly what the raw, uh, raw data is and also the decoding of the raw data that's going there. So um, until, I think, late summer last year, uh, we only had Bluetooth host support in, in Zephyr. Um, but uh, something really nice happened during last year. Before 2016, uh, there was pretty much no open source Bluetooth controller implementation uh, that I know of. I've never heard of any. If somebody knows, then please, please tell me. But uh, uh, in the big, uh, first half of last year, uh, Runtime, that had a presentation here just before me, they come, came out with Minute uh, with a full open source uh, controller implementation. Uh, supporting Nordic Semiconductor uh, controllers. And uh, shortly uh, thereafter, uh, Nordic Semiconductor themselves uh, approached the Zephyr project that they have also a controller implementation they would like to open source and get included into Zephyr. So uh, we uh, collaborated with Nordic, and as a result, uh, Zephyr 1.6 uh, has support for um, Bluetooth controllers. Um, since it's coming from Nordic, it uh, naturally initially only supports uh, Nordic's controllers. They have their NRF51 and NRF52 based ones. But the way that uh, the implementation is designed, uh, it has a radio abstraction. And we are actually hoping to uh, expand it to support uh, more than just Nordic controllers. The first candidate we have uh, is um, one from um, NXP, actually. Um, the, uh, if, if you think, just think about the protocol uh, layers uh, in the Bluetooth stack, um, the, what the controller implements, the biggest part of it is uh, called the link layer. And uh, the uh, support or, or the functionality of the uh, controller that we got in, into Zephyr is very flexible. 
Uh, most uh, Bluetooth devices that you have on the market right now, they're quite limited in what they can do. Um, what you have on your phones or on your PCs, for example, they typically can only do one uh, slave connection at a time. Uh, they can connect to multiple peripherals, but they can just be a single, uh, if, if they want to be in the peripheral role, they can just have one connection. Uh, however, the one we have in Zephyr, it can support pretty, pretty much, uh, well not, uh, not unlimited, but it doesn't have any specific limit on uh, the number of connections it can do. It's dependent on the uh, amount of runtime memory you have, and uh, uh, also, what exactly, what kind of timing constraints you want to do for every single connection. And uh, of course, uh, the controller exposes HGI on its highest uh, layer, so we were nicely able to uh, hook it up with the uh, host stack in Zephyr. Um, I briefly mentioned about this, but uh, you can configure Zephyr in any of these, these possible uh, combinations of uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, roles. Uh, where you only uh, run the uh, controller side, uh, where you basically have a separate application that's exposing the uh, HCI transport. There's a special raw HCI API that uh, the application hooks onto to be able to expose um, just HCI at the highest layer. Uh, you have the host only option where you have the controller residing on another uh, uh, CPU. Um, where you then need an actual HCI driver that does the physical transport, or you can run them both in a single, uh, single uh, controller. Like all, all of the uh, Nordic semiconductor boards uh, have just a single uh, CPU where you run both the controller and, and the host in the same. Uh, some examples of uh, where you could find these. Uh, Intel has its uh, Curie-based devices, like the Arduino uh, one on one. Uh, it has an NRF51 based Bluetooth controller and a Quark SC based application processor. So uh, we are running the controller only uh, mode of uh, Zephyr there on the NRF51 side. The uh, carbon board uh, from Linaro has a similar thing, except instead of Quark SC, it has a uh, Cortex M4 uh, processor. But on the NRF51, again, it's running the controller only uh, mode of Zephyr. The main difference there is that the Arduino uses UART, the uh, Carbon uses uh, SPI for the uh, HCI transport. And uh, likewise, you would run the host only configuration on the uh, application processor of uh, these boards. Uh, the QMO demonstration I used there, uh, that's also running the host only configuration with the uh, UART HCI driver because that's how uh, QMO exposes the connection it has to the controller. And then uh, pretty much all of the Nordic boards, uh, they are running both in the same uh, CPU. Um, so in addition to low energy, uh, we do have basic support for Bluetooth Classic, if, if you want to take advantage of that. Uh, we have all the low level protocols implemented like um, RFCOM, L2CAP. Uh, you have the generic access profile where you're able to discover devices, configure your own discoverability. Um, to create connections and so on. Uh, they support both for uh, service discovery client and server, so you can discover services in another device, or uh, you can register your own uh, Bluetooth Classic services and have another device discover them. And we have a couple of uh, sample profiles implemented as well. The main kind of uh, high-level use case uh, that's been in mind here is uh, a headset where you would want to have uh, the advanced audio distribution protocol for stereo audio and uh, answer your profile for doing calls and call control, and then uh, for media control, the uh, audio video remote control profile. And um, I mentioned we are right now working uh, with uh, Bluetooth 5 since the specification went public um, just end of last year. Uh, it's something that's gonna continue throughout this year, and I hope that, well, Zephyr 1.7 won't be having uh, many Bluetooth 5 features, but uh, 1.8 should al already have uh, many more of them. Uh, Bluetooth mesh is, is a big thing coming from the Bluetooth uh, SIG uh, uh, soon, but uh, I'll be able to talk more about that once, once the specification actually gets released uh, to the general public. Uh, if you are working for a company that already has, uh, is already a Bluetooth SIG member and has access to these specifications, please uh, come and talk to me. Uh, we can arrange uh, collaboration possibilities on things like Bluetooth Mesh, which is not yet public, but uh, 
uh, what we don't want to have is different companies ending up uh, doing uh, like duplicate implementations of features just because uh, they can't uh, share it to the public and, and do collaboration on it. So if you're interested in this and you have access to the specs, uh, we can arrange um, collaboration possibilities before it's actually uh, available to the general public. Um, what we, I, I mentioned this also, what we want to do is have the um, controller run on more radios than Nordics. The abstraction is there, but we really need to have at least one uh, other radio to see that we've done the right kind of API definition there uh, for uh, that abstraction. Uh, there are a couple of features uh, also um, that we haven't implemented yet, such as uh, link layer privacy, which basically lets you push the uh, uh, resolution of private addresses down to the controller instead of having to do this on the host side. That's something we have to do at the moment. Um, also, uh, the uh, standard HCI specification, in some aspect, it's a little bit limited in what you can do. So uh, what we're going to be working on is an extension to it. It's called so-called vendor HCI um, specification. Uh, there are things such as being able to set your public address, uh, which you cannot do using standard, standard HCI commands. Um, another example is uh, Nordic controllers. Uh, they have in their own special uh, memory location stored um, a static random address that's supposed to be used as their identity address. In order for us to use this, um, the standard ATI doesn't provide any kind of mechanism of reading it out from the host side. Unless the host is running on the same CPU, then we can just access the, uh, the memory directly. So uh, we would have a command that we can read out that address and then program it back to be used as the identity address of the controller. So that's something that um, we'll be working on as well during this year. Uh, most likely for Zephyr 1.8, we'll already have the uh, specification document for this in the source tree. And um, yeah, I'd like to encourage anybody who's interested in, in uh, Bluetooth support and, and Zephyr to get involved since it's a completely open project. Um, we have an open mailing list. Uh, we have a very active IRC channel on uh, Freenode where we have daily conversations uh, and uh, we have people available there basically around the clock in different time zones. So just come and ask your questions. And um, same goes for the uh, issue tracking and the uh, source code management, uh, Jira and um, Gerrit. And uh, that's what I had so far. Um, any questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, if you have a Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been using Lin Linux uh, to do testing of uh, IPv6 over LE. It's still a little bit uh, rough on the edges on, on the Linux side. Uh, it's uh, lacking a proper uh, user space interface, uh, which in turn has prevented the creation of proper kind of higher level interfaces in Linux. Um, currently, uh, to operate um, uh, this in Linux, you need to use debugfs. You basically echo the address of the Zephyr device to debugfs, and Linux connects to it, and so on. But basic things are working there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, so we actually have a sample application for it. Uh, could have shown it. So it's um, uh, not IPM. Sorry. <laughs> Samples Bluetooth IPSP. So that that that's the one that implements the uh, node role of the IPSP profile. And there's a readme there also that describes basically. How to set it up? Uh, I think it also, yeah, it also goes through exactly what you need to do on the Linux side with uh, debugfs and and so on. Yeah. Yep. So this one has an Intel Bluetooth controller. It's the Snowfield Peak controller from Intel. Uh, 
Actually, it's it something PCI. It's in USB, of course. Uh, that doesn't tell you much, but um, Actually, this one says 4.1. There exists a 4.2 firmware. I have seen it. Uh, I think they might have rolled back because there was some issues with the late, uh, latest one. Um, but it should be able to do some 4.2 stuff. No, I don't think you need anything special for that. Yes? So, in your slide, uh, you mentioned uh, HTTP or SSH. Yeah. For example, SPC encoder or SPC Yeah, so the uh, SPC codec is mandatory for HTTP. So, uh, our assumption is actually the, the way that it's currently designed is that uh, the assumption is that the controller takes, takes care of it. So it's using um, uh, basically a controller side codec. At the moment, we, uh, we don't have plans to have uh, the SPC codec on the Zephyr it, itself. Um, there, are, there are many controllers that have the ability to do that, and they do it much more efficiently there on the controller side instead of us having to do all the uh, encoding or decoding on the Zephyr side. But uh, if you have a use case where you need to do that, then feel free to contribute it. I mean, there, there exists, at least Linux uses. Uh, it's a, what, what's the license of the? Uh, OK. OK, that one works. Any other questions? All right, well, feel free to come up and talk to me later if you have something. Thanks. <laughs>